Well, of course, uh, lots of coverage on the BBC over the next couple of days. With us this morning, the historian Tessa Dunlop. Tessa, good morning. Um, let's delve straight inside the newspapers today, because as you'd expect, it really does dominate a lot of the coverage, of course, all the commemorations. Um, and you've picked out this story. This is uh, related to Michael Mopogo, who wrote War Horse, of course. Indeed. And he's actually written a follow up to War Horse. War Horse was the most brilliant book. He's very clever, Michael Mopogo, of course, traditionally a children's author. But the way in which he weaves war into his stories without lionising, military events, but really getting to the emotion of them, the heart of them. And War Horse was brilliant, award-winning on so many fronts mm. from the perspective of the horse, Joey. And this now is the story uh, taken from a different angle. It's the father telling the son of the grandfather's story. And he's going to be reading extracts, I believe, a big commemoration event, uh, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are going to be there, Theresa May, uh, all the high hegens of Europe. And of course, there always needs to be, I think, on these occasions, an element of artistic um, interpretation to really get to the heart, the, the guts of, of what this war meant and where it leaves us. Because I think it's all well and good having commemorations and centenary anniversaries. They're important. And we've had several of them. David Cameron was a big believer in funding them, of course. Um, but we need to take a step back and think, OK, 100 years on, what does this tell us? Because oh. 1917, you know, on both sides, nearly half a million young men died in mud and for what? For a couple of kilometres. I mean, it was mm. revolting. Um, and people came out of that, stumbled out of that post-1918, unable to articulate. That's where we get the two minutes of silence from, the armistice. But there were no words, you know. And... And everyone said, never again, this is the war to end all wars. And it was scarcely two decades later. And we have World War II. And what we had in the interim, of course, in that interwar period, and, and you know, the dark decade of the 1930s was the rise of nationalism, the rise of populism, fascism. We have to be so careful. Peace is so fragile. And I think that should be the takeaway message. That well, life is so valuable. A conflict over Europe on a complete, in a completely different context then, Moment also in many of the one. papers this morning. Um, this from inside The Observer, talking about the divisions over um, the future of Brexit. Mm. And you see there the four heads. They've got Michael Barnier, just in case you think he's leading one of the, the British parties. He's not, <laughs> I'm not sure how he slipped in. But interestingly, this is an Observer story. And they write of Labour grandees joining the fray over the single market. In particular, they pull out Neil Kinnock and Charlie Faulkner, who are apparently going to create, um, well, a bit of a problem for Jeremy Corbyn and the Eurosceptics who are currently leading the Labour Party. And why this is interesting is because we hear a lot from the big beasts of the Conservative Party who are anti what the Eurosceptics in the Tories are doing. You know, Chris Patton, Michael Heseltine, John Major, they're always standing up and sort of saying, what's happened? This is not the direction we should be taking the party or the country. And I think to date, Labour's got away with it obfuscating, not being clear, not really putting its cards on the table, because, of course, this defies party lines, the issue of Europe, and you only need to go back to the 1975 referendum, yeah. which I don't think we do really enough, um, where we reviewed whether we should be... It was promised by Harold Wilson's um, Labour Party that that would happen if they were voted in. So, Julie, in 1975, there was this vote. And what you saw there was Harold Wilson fighting to stay in the EEC alongside Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. And on the other side, your hard lefts, your Tony Benz, your Michael Foots, your Barbara Castles, where naturally, of course, Corbyn is, is more well, at home. And I think it was Sadiq Khan side. yesterday who came out yeah. saying there might be a way to manage this so that we don't actually leave Brexit, which causes all kinds of problems yeah. with a certain core of Labour voters who were very keen to get out of the EU. Well, so, then, yeah, you're quite right. And there you get the progressive end. Yeah. You know, Sadiq is a bullish and very popular character, but only within one wing. That's what's so fascinating about this... Um, this, this Brexit um, maelstrom. But another controversy. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, back to Theresa May's dress. This is a familiar on the tale, continent. isn't it? So, <laughs> Theresa on a holidays, uh, pictured in this dress. Um, and the usual thing, isn't it? You know, any celebrity politician may be pictured in something, you'd expect sales to rise. But the familiar tale, it's cheaper to buy in Europe on the same website. You say the familiar tale. I mean, recently this has We're been so the We're so used to being British, uh, you know, British yeah. retailers charging more. I mean, I'm talking about things like technology, particularly things like Apple's and yeah. iPods and laptops and all that sort of thing. But it's a case for Well, clothing. the case is, where did Theresa May buy this <laughs> dress? Yeah. Incidentally, before it became a sort of cost-cutting nightmare controversy, poor old Theresa May, everything she touches seems to turn to dust, um, it was commended 
by various different style uh, gurus, apparently a savvy buy and people like the pastel girliness of what she was wearing. Uh, however, aside from her and her um, pale pins on, uh, on, on the Italian seafront, in, or was it in the mountains? What the big question is, is Lord Wolfson, who's the chief executive of Next and was a key leave campaigner, so once again we tie back to Brexit, is actually selling his dress for more in Britain than you can get it on the continent. And the question is why VAT apparently is the same. So we can't yeah. say it was because of, you know, uh, domestic VAT laws. Um, and it seems likely that the buying power of the euro now outguns the buying power of the pound in each country. And therefore, you will get better bargains. Does that mean you should go online and do your Zara's, Mango's and Next's? Online, apparently not, because it might be harder to return the goods if they don't look as good as they do on Theresa May. <laughs> Savvy advice, Tessa. Thank you very, very much. Well we'll done. see you again a little bit later on. Thanks, Tessa. Nice to see you.